Welcome to part 5 of lecture 3 of Bluff Body Aerodynamics. So now let's talk about how we deal with our turbulence modeling as we get close to the solid walls. Of course the turbulent fluctuations have to go to zero at the walls. Why is this the case? Because of the no slip condition, right? It doesn't matter whether we're dealing with the average velocity or the instantaneous velocity fluctuations, it must always be the case that the velocity right next to the wall has zero relative velocity compared to that wall. So this means our basic turbulence terms and the way we do the modeling isn't really valid when we're very close to the walls of our geometry. So we need to have something special that we call wall treatment. The way we do this is by um, taking advantage of the fact that non-dimensionally, the velocity profile in boundary layers tends to be somewhat universal if done in, in non-dimensionalized in the appropriate way. There's also no obvious way for a CFD calculation to know where in the boundary layer a point in the flow is. So we use the non-dimensional wall distance called y plus for this. And y plus is uh, the distance from the wall here. We're assuming the y coordinate is perpendicular to the wall, but that's just sort of to make it easy to define y is actually just distance normal to the wall. So y plus is that times the square root of some, something called tau wall, which is the wall shear stress, divided by rho and uh, the viscosity squared. Sorry, velocity squared. Um, and the, for a turbulent boundary layer, particularly a turbulent boundary layer in a neutral pressure gradient, the distribution of the velocity within, versus this non-dimensional wall distance is pretty universal. So uh, once we get sort of past delta plus, which is sort of the, the thickness of the boundary layer, then the flow is essentially behaves invisibly outside of that. From y plus 300 to delta plus, we have basically the viscous layer, um, where there's some viscous effects causing a decrease in stagnation pressure. Um, and then there's a viscous sublayer close to the wall and a fur fully tur turbulent outer layer, uh, where something called the logarithmic law of the wall holds. So this non-dimensional velocity depends just on y plus, and we call the non-dimensional velocity u plus. Again, this is the velocity times the square root of rho over the wall shear stress. So in this region between y plus 300 and uh, the outer edge of the boundary layer, the turbulence models are still valid. And in the region very close to the wall uh, for y plus, say, less than 5, um, there's a simple linear behavior of u plus equals y plus. Then um, in, from about 30 to 300, the profile can be well matched by u plus is 1 over kappa, where this is some constant, uh, times the natural logarithm of y plus plus a constant. And again, the constant is sort of set by the, uh, the, the other, other flow uh, condition. But there's a mismatch between the two profiles in the range of y plus uh, 5 to 30. In other words, they don't smoothly match up with each other. Um, so this means that typically it's often a, a good idea to avoid having um, the first uh, cell of your boundary layer be in that distance between y plus of 5 and 30 because it can be difficult to um, have accurate uh, assessment of the, the wall shear stress in that case or the wall velocity or near wall velocity. Now as I said that profile is in a neutral pressure gradient but typically the models are corrected for the presence of pressure gradients. Um, so there's some ways that these equations are modified to account for the fact that they may exist in a favorable or adverse pressure gradient. And that how these near wall models are used is based on our computational grid. And we'll talk more about grid generation a little bit later today. Um, but in the fir if the first cell has a y plus less than 5, then basically we use u plus equals y plus to get the velocity in that first cell. And if the first cell has y plus greater than 30, then we can use the log law of the wall instead. If the first cell has y plus more than 300, then the log law no longer applies. And essentially, the results are going to be meaningless. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Mo most modern mo uh, turbulence models do have special treatment for the first cell y plus falling between 5 and 30, but some implementations do still require avoiding this region for the first cell. So 
In practical use of, of, say, commercial codes, it's important to read the documentation for the turbulence model you're using to make sure that your grid is appropriate. But when everything's done right, RAND's models work for drag prediction. Um, here's some results of RAND's computations for some reference bodies that approximate common types of car shapes. Um, and what we see is that the experimental and CFD results for the drag coefficients are really in very good agreement to, you know, within on the order of about one to two percent error at most. Um, so th this sort of shows us that we can reliably get these numbers, and maybe even more importantly, that we can get the trends and variations, right? So um, it's ne not always necessarily the most important thing to get the exact value of the drag coefficient right. But if I'm comparing two designs, I'd like to have the deltas be accurate. And we see that indeed that's the case. 